and it's time for the digital download. Um, and my name is William Shorten, and I've been um, uh, volunteered, or I volunteered to be the, the guest editor again. Vol voluntold. Uh, <laughs> voluntold. <laughs> voluntold. No, nobody told me this time. So um, I think now, by now, we've been going for, for a few months now, and I think everybody probably knows the crowd. So we're not going to waste any time today. This is Eric's um, idea, innovative idea for today, that we're not going to spend uh, 10 minutes going through and introducing ourselves when you've got our names and details on the screen. Uh, you can also go to our LinkedIn profiles, and all of our details are up to date there. So uh, what are we going to talk about today? When we look at what's been coming through the, our, our feeds over the last week, um, it's really been clear to me that um, there's a lot of people who are out and about, uh, returning to what was the kind of normal world, going out and taking part in events like uh, conferences, like trade fairs, like going out and seeing customers. So there's a lot of that I've, I've seen coming through the feed uh, this week. Um, we've also had some examples of um, people kind of posting a lot about recruitment, uh, and I know that's been a great uh, subject for us talking on in this uh, forum about how people now reach out and recruit people, and we'll be touching on that a little bit today. And we've also got examples of kind of how management is running. So in the UK, unfortunately, yesterday, we had a really bad example of how to handle uh, managing people and um, uh, there was this announcement that was done by video to lay off 800 people working for, for P&O uh, oh. passenger services. So we've got a lot to talk about today. And so without further ado, let's jump in. And um, we're going to go to Alex first, because Alex got a piece precisely about kind of bad management and how people manage in the digital era. So over to you, Alex. Afternoon, all. Um Yes, yeah, so if I share my screen, this so this is a post about uh, so a guy called Daniel Abrahams. If you've heard of him, he's very active on LinkedIn. He runs his own digital marketing agency, um, but on LinkedIn he's got more than six hundred thousand followers. Uh, so if I share the right screen, here. make sure it's the right one. This could be career ending. <laughs> what am I sharing? Or, or accelerating. Sharing? Or accelerating. <laughs> yeah, if Nick can get through the water, I think we could all get <laughs> There we go. That's so funny. That's immediately what came to mind when they said that. <laughs> Nick and his water. Oh. So here is 95,000 reactions on this post. Wow. So I, so I love this and it, it really got me thinking that, um, you know, we, we, I certainly feel so much more empowered, um, you know, feel more in control. Um, you know, I've had, I've had my fair share of, of bad bosses in the past, um, in, in recruitment, uh, many years ago, one, one boss said to me, what the hell are you doing? Why isn't that effing phone salad taped to your head? <laughs> Sorry, that's just like a hero. Me there. <laughs> Eric, Eric was Eric. Eric was was that you as the Victorian factory owner? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going into I'm just going into my notes for possible future additions <laughs> to our process. Video <laughs> skit. No, sir, it's implanted. It's implanted. Yeah, that just caught me. Why isn't it sellotaped to your forehead? Yeah, or, or your head? Brilliant. <laughs> So, so you know, we should feel more empowered. Um, we don't have to put up with bad bosses. We don't have to put up with bully bosses anymore. Um, and so I kind of wanted to, you know, uh, touch on the fact that, um, uh, you know, you've got, you've got leaders and you've got managers or bosses in, in, in my view. And I just wanted to throw that out there and see, see how that landed with everyone. What do you feel about the leader versus manager? So that's exactly that's exactly my 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 post and the, the whole thing that I'm going to talk about. The the I think it's I think it's um, I think it's all become really obscured. The rules about leadership and management, and I'll talk about it more in the next section. But um, yeah, but, uh, but leadership, but, dry. Just, but leadership and management are two different things. Totally, totally, and they're the same thing. 
they're two different things and they're the same thing. We can talk about that more in the next in the next thing. I think the I think the carved down the middle separation thing is where we've gone wrong. It's where we've gone wrong. How to make the motivate stuff from the 1800s. I think, I think Alex, Alex is a great post. And I think I agree with you. I think it's the, the feeling that we now all feel far more empowered. You know, my parents were of the, you know, jobs for life situation. You know, they, they joined organizations and they expected there to, them to be there for life. I don't, I don't think we, I don't think we, as a, as the world, do feel more empowered. I think maybe we on this call do, but I think well, most I, people well, yes, are like your parents. There was, a, there was something that I, there's something that I shared, shared internally on Slack, uh, which was a figure, which was that um, I can't remember how much it was. It 40, 50 percent of of people actually do not feel empowered, yeah. and they do not feel that they can walk away from from jobs, which was a, um, I thought was interesting counter argument. Um, but certainly in, in the environment and the, and, and the privilege that I live in, we feel that we can do that. I, I think I, that, <clears throat> that speaks to the reaction I had when I first read this. Uh, the reaction from Daniel's post is, well, yeah, that's, that's a no-brainer. But when you think about it, actually, kudos to him for being so enlightened to recognize that he was in an environment that wasn't sustainable and do something about it. Too many of us just get along to get along. And we might have a job that puts us in that type of environment, but instead of doing something about it, we feel powerless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I go ahead. Adam. I think that's quite an easy choice though, isn't it? So if somebody says to anybody on the call, choose between your work or your family, then, you know, we are noticeable by the fact we've just walked out the door. I think though that the challenge comes in the work environment when it isn't as straightforward as that. You right. Know, when when you're, you what you consider to be your roles or responsibilities or what you're, uh, you're, you're doing uh, gradually grows or nibbles away into the, the other things that you do. So it's not like uh, you're not going to be able to go to your son's birthday today. It's like you're going to be a little bit late for your son's birthday today. Or yeah. uh, I know you don't like dealing with this customer, but you have to deal with this customer. Or, you know, and, and actually, I think that's where that gray area is. And I think, you you know, you're right, Tim, 50 percent of people aren't empowered, you know, and that's because they they are in an environment in many cases that they've created for themselves where they are um, they are living from one paycheck to the next and if you haven't got a month or two months or six months or five years worth of of cash in the bank then actually you you can't leave right. a job you have yep. to find something to dovetail in perfectly and that in itself carries a huge risk you know you've worked at company x for five years you're going to start at company y within your first three months you're not a good fit and you're asked to leave and actually you're in a whole world of pain then so, so I think I think I think the, the amount of people that could walk out to uh, to Robert's point there are, are are people walking out on jobs and then trying to find trying to find a job or it used to be find a job and then leave your job. Um, I think the people that you spoke about there that are able to say right, okay, I'm comfortable enough to be able to walk away because I don't like this. That's got to be the minority in this world. I would imagine so. Yeah, got to you be. Oh, yeah. It. I think that's true, but I think what we're seeing um, happen right now is we're we're moving <laughs> we're, we're moving along a continuum right of increasing um, empowerment and this is now starting to move into the workplace mm. and it's really I think um, a function of social media and people feeling like they can, um, get together with their community and they can fight back. Okay. So we see it with, um, I mean, you, you hear people talking about cancel culture or what have you, but you do see this idea that people say, wait a minute, whatever it is that you're doing, it's not right. I don't agree with it. And now I'm going to use social media to get a whole bunch, tell a whole bunch of other people about it. <laughs> and see if we can't change the situation. But that comes from a position of strength, doesn't it? It comes from a no, position of I'm strength. No, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about in this particular circumstance. I'm no, saying that. I think that's true for everybody. Culturally, 
culturally, I think, I think, I think um, it, it, it just depends on the context. I think it does depend on the position as well. I mean, I, I have a story from that my father uh, experienced and, and told us about. This was back in the early 80s. And he was working for, for an organization. The boss was really kind of focused, you know, really put work first. And uh, he called a management meeting on a, on a Sunday. And my father went along to it because it, it was quite new within his time of working for that organization. And at the end of the meeting, when they were going around any other business, he just said, well, what, one thing, um, you know, I, I'm really committed to this organization. Um, but I just have to let you know that if you call another meeting on a Sunday, I won't be attending because I'm going to be at, back with my family. And, and you know, not everybody is going to be in the situation or be able to feel that they're strong enough to stand up. But sometimes, and let's give a little bit of benefit of the doubt to some leaders, that they get so wrapped up in their businesses and so focused that they lose sight and lose perspective of everything that's going on. And sometimes they need to be challenged and pushed back and say, hang on a second, do you realise what you're asking about here? Yep. And at least give them one opportunity to kind of step back and say, okay, you're right. You know, I had let things get out of kilter. I, I was once given some advice, which I've always lived by, which is that um, that someone said to me, if you don't like the way that the organisation is, is built at the moment, or you don't like your boss at the moment, don't worry about it, because it all changes in six months. Oh, that's, that's, that's so right. <laughs> that is so right. I, it's amazing when we speak about the um, the, the impact of that change. I, I once worked, worked with an organization that had a very people-centered CEO. And uh, people would have walked off, walked off a cliff for this particular CEO. People-centered. It was all about the people. Keep me out of the limelight. I want to put all you guys first. And it's all about protecting you guys and great benefits and a great working environment. That person was changed out for a, for a new CEO um, who did his hundred days and then took the directors away to a hotel and we were sitting in the in the hotel and he said, right, my observations were far too focused on people. Our focus as directors needs to be on pumping as much as much into this foie gras goose as much as we can to explode the liver so that in two years' time when we exit, we all exit with a suitcase full of cash. We're far too focused on legacy, culture and people. We need to be more focused on profit. And that, that was the day that everything changed. The dye, the dye was dripped into the water and everything changed in that organization. A fracture occurred on the board, which permeated through the whole organization and the company split. And, 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 of, course, and of course, what happened? Was everybody <coughs> going to walk away with such a large amount of uh, no. bag of cash from it? No, no. So, so, so we're cancelling this, we're cancelling that, all that stuff that was done that's adding no value and is actually just eaten into EBITDA, we're cancelling all of that because this is about suitcases full of cash and the exit. Um, so there you go. There's a, there's a modern company that was going well, was in the ascension. The graphs were pointing up the way. The culture was pointing up the way. Very focused on health and safety and organizational culture and, and team environment and team spirit to... Thou shalt do and thou shalt not. And there's going to be lots of nots anymore because all of those things that we did cost us money and we're all about EBITDA. We're all about max, maximizing the multiple and making the biggest EBITDA we can. That that was the day. That was the day. It was almost you can hear American Pie. That was the day the music changed. <laughs> I mean, it's, the, the music there, died. I, I think that story is is actually not that uncommon that mm -hmm. there is a single person that comes into an organization and their mindset is uh, either antiquated, they're thinking backwards the way it used to be, or they're thinking about themselves and how they can exploit the situation for the next two or three years, get the most out of it, and then walk away. And I, I cannot recall where I read this, but I basically read the story of Blockbuster and Netflix. And, you know, the common wisdom is that Blockbuster didn't do the things that they needed to do in order to fend off Netflix. But actually what happened was they did a lot of the things that they needed to do. But a leader came in and said, no, we're going to go back. We're going to focus on the retail stores. We're not going to focus on Blockbuster.com. We're going to do all these other things. And what ended up happening? 
blockbuster gone. I got to I can't remember where I where I read that, but um I was surprised because I think the common with the common thinking about it is that they didn't respond at all to what Netflix was doing. And right. and that's what they what happened. But really, it was a, literally a single leader came in, a new CEO, and he didn't want to go the same direction as the old CEO. He wanted to go back, focus on the retail stores, didn't see the digital thing. And we all know so, what happened to Blockbuster. That, it's, a, it's a great example, uh, Lenwood. And I'm actually going to use that as a segue into Eric's part, because part of what you're talking about there is almost as if organizations and individuals have binary choices about yeah. one, one uh, behavior or one actor or, or another. And um, Eric's piece, I think, really nicely chimes in with that. Yeah, I'm going to try and put it up here. Um, I guess, I guess, just following on from that is the fact that I found it quite interesting because the the exit foie gras goose feeding CEO could have actually pitched that in a way that guys, we need to be more centered on the multiple here. Keep the culture thing. Actually, that culture and what we've established here will help us to achieve that. But I'd like more focus on profit. I'd like to maybe trim some sales somewhere. You know, but the, the whole fact is it had to it had to be binary. Switch all that off. We're going to do it my way. Sort of feeds into uh, to what I'm gonna what I'm gonna show if I can if I can share it. So just give me one second here. Uh, I don't think this is going to work. Yes, it will. It will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I just needed to get rid of Alex's. Can you see that? Hold on. Mm. Yeah. You can. We can now. Yeah, that's that's great, Eric. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Right. So, so this was it's actually a post from last year, but it started circling around Twitter again uh, recently because um, because it's quite relevant. Um, and I thought it was pretty good. I've actually tried to track down uh, the person that posted it uh, and try and connect with them to get a bit of a chat going because actually they, they put quite a lot of content like this. And the fact is that yeah, you can read it for yourselves. Um, we we can all we can all read this. It's that it's the fact that. For me, as for for me, the last year has been about the center of the Venn diagram. You know, pulling things together. You know, we talk about personal content and business content. What happens when you blend the two? What happens in the middle? That life cycle piece in there, that life content piece, uh, is very relevant. There's lots of things that are blending. Um, so we can be vulnerable and strong. We can be successful and humble. We can be disciplined and relaxed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this sort of plays into the whole fact that. I think uh, in many times in my career, we've all seen these posters and they, they drive me up the wall, to be quite honest. these I think they're meant to be most motivational posters that say a I leader... Looks uh, do, you think, do you think Victorian factory manager has motivational posters? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it it's, be her house, but it's anti-motivational posters. It's like, eat quicker. <laughs> Work harder. Work harder. <laughs> and sleep faster. Work sets you free. <laughs> So 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 you see these things all the time. You'll see them on many social media sites, and they kinda they kind of glitch my glitch my personal matrix a little bit. A leader looks after a team, a manager oversees a team, a leader casts a vision for the team, a manager is an expert at executing tasks, uh, a leader innovates, um, a manager uses what works. Um, uh, a manager is, a, is an administrator, well, as a, a leader is an innovator. A manager is work focused. A leader is people focused. Uh, now, the, the, the whole, you know, the, uh, a leader finishes a sentence with a question mark, a manager finishes it with a full stop or a period, drives me up the wall a little bit because for anyone who's been in any leadership position or manager manager's position, you are a bit of both. You are a bit of a lot of things. There's more than two things. You're more, you're more than either that or that. And I think this perspective that a leader does this, for example, we talk about the fact that, um, that traditional views of management focus exclusively on sort of building competence and control and the appropriate balance of power and all of that and the old fashioned sense of management. But that view om omits the essential sort of leadership traits of inspiration, vision, human passion and you know, driving corporate success. Um, but it, it does cause a split. I've worked with fantastic leaders who've come into organizations, business leaders, organizations that were at death's door, you know, like, and there's a famous story about Tom Eric when he came into a particular organization, that it was two weeks away from shutting the doors and thousands of people being laid off. Tom Eric came in, he brought a team of people with him, he hired a management team, and he put a process in place to chop off a bit there, do more of that, do less of this, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, a couple of years later, a rebranded organization, 
with with hundreds of millions in profit. Um, I have to say, he wasn't the greatest people leader. He wasn't the greatest people person. Um, he was, uh, and actually a bit direct in his thinking as in his instruction. But Tom Errett, for for his business acumen, his knowledge of how a sector worked, and his passion, his personal passion, pulled people along. Many of us, hundreds and you know thousands of people in that organization, would have followed that guy off a cliff if he said, I'm, "We're going this way." Everyone would have gone. Now he wasn't that. I'm not saying. I'm not saying. That it's uh, it's it's all a sort of like fluff fluff and mis- a misnomer. What I'm saying is there was a, a brilliant leader, a brilliant business leader who had the attention of what fifteen thousand people and was killing it in his market, and a known leader who wasn't that great at all the soft stuff. Wasn't that great? So you can be both, is my opinion. And of course, the key thing as well is also understanding where you may have shortcomings or weaknesses. And then using others to counterbalance that. that that's been really smart in terms of leadership. Yes. And, and drawing in the wider resource that you've got within your team. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a classic example of where you often see... I used to work for an organisation where the CEO was well known for... Um, his strengths and weaknesses were well known. His weaknesses were he wasn't very good at, fi- um, at financial accounts. He wasn't a very good people person, et cetera, et cetera. And so what he did was he hired an extremely good CFO. He hired an extremely good um, uh, people leader, et cetera. And he surrounded himself with people that were which were the um, opposite of him because they had his they had the strengths where he was weak. And he, he, his leadership skill was in giving them a voice and giving them space. Yes, and, 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 absolutely. And understanding and realising that he had a weakness in that area. Um, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of leaders that, that are like that in terms of understanding that and then getting advisors in to basically advise them. They don't need to be. CEOs do not need to know everything. And leaders do not need to know everything. But it's about understanding what the weakness is and then bringing in the people that to, to support them. That requires tremendous... Um, security in I, who you are as a person and humility yeah, yeah. right to oh, know hey, amount i don't of, uh, of i don't have to be the center yeah. i'm with nick yeah. self-awareness i think is um, key yeah. as a leader you can you can be both or you can be one but you need to know which one you are and have the support <laughs> of others around you um or know when you're going in too hard on someone or like it's not landing with your people. It's contextual too. I run an exercise with uh, students that I'm training called style awareness. Are you collaborative or are you competitive? Well, given one situation, I will be competitive. Given another, I will be collaborative. The key is be consistent in this situation be that same way every time so that as a leader, your people know what to expect from you. If you're collaborative one time in in this situation and competitive the next, then people don't know how to take your direction, how to follow you. Well, Tim's comment about uh, great leaders surrounding themselves with people that make up for their strengths. I think the best example of this is uh, Napoleon Hill who wrote the book about Andrew Carnegie and his friend's success, published in 1937. And he went and interviewed all of Carnegie's friends and Carnegie himself. And Carnegie, who was at the time the richest man in the world, famously said, I don't know anything about the mining, the production, the distribution, the marketing and the selling of steel. But I surround myself with a team who know everything about the mining, the manufacture, the distribution, the marketing and the selling of steel. And that's why he was successful. He said, my job is to allow these people to be as good as they can possibly be. And that, that's a true leader. And further to your point, Lambert, it's absolutely about having confidence and a sense of self-awareness and, uh, and not feeling that you need to be the person that says, that that's my idea or I'm doing this. or But saying, you know more about this than I do, so it's better if we follow your lead on this. And it, it certainly worked for Andrew Carnegie, didn't it? Has anyone has anyone ever has anyone ever sat at the meeting and had to report into their a terrible word I hate the word boss but report into their boss the day before or that afternoon before we go into the meeting on all the all the stats and all the stuff that you're doing and then and then sat in that meeting and heard all your stuff 
being played back as what I'm doing is and, and my idea is and I've come up with a great idea we're going to be doing more of this and you're sitting there like that's life yeah. in corporate America hearing <laughs> 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 in, in a previous mouth <laughs> my, my, my first my first proper corporate job uh, I was working direct for the CEO and he was a lovely lovely guy and you would be in a meeting and something would go well and the client would say uh, oh you've done a fantastic do job there Tim it, it wasn't Tim, but, you know, you did, did a fantastic job there, Tim. And Tim would say, oh, no, 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 it wasn't me. It was Adam that did this. Or it would be something that's not gone well. And he would say, Adam, you've done a really, really bad job here. And Tim would step in and say, don't blame him. It's my fault. I didn't brief him properly. Anyway, uh, he was the CEO. He brought in a managing director of his this, of, of that division of the company that I worked for. And she was absolutely the antithesis of this. If something was going really well, she would say, yes, I'm really glad that I was able to, to, to pull that together. And if something went badly and the client would say to her, so uh, why have you done that? Why hasn't this worked? She would say, yes, Adam, why hasn't that worked? <laughs> <laughs> it was just an excruciating experience. It's like, it's working. like when, when uh, Andy Murray won Wimbledon, he was British. When he lost, he was Scottish. <laughs> no, that's not the same at all. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Nick, did you? You were about to start one there. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add to the conversation and say, um, uh, from a slightly different uh, viewpoint and experience, it, one of my previous roles, um, it was the, it was very much the, the micromanagement that was just drove me insane. Literally wanting to know and being accountable for every single minute of what you were doing with your your day was it. it as a as a creative, I found that so constrictive. It's like just let me create, it's, yeah, and it's just like isn't it? Absolutely yeah, suffocating. yeah. Well, let's let's take this on to the next stage. So we're going to stay with Venn diagrams, and we're also <laughs> going to be talking a bit about kind of uh, self awareness and strengths, etc. So, uh, Adam, can you can you share your piece, please? Yeah. So, so I, I've not been to Japan, um, but a few years ago, my son was very interested in Japanese culture, and previously, in fact, at the company where I had. The great CEO and the dreadful managing director of that division. One of our clients was a Japanese company, and we did a lot of work out for the European uh, headquarters. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things, or the things that I love about Japanese culture, is that they have a fantastic lexicon of of words. Mm. So you know, there are words for specific things. So on on the downside, one of those words is karoshi. Uh, karoshi is where you are working yourself to death. And actually, the, this Japanese company that I, I was a client of ours, uh, lots of the people were suffering from that particular issue where, you know, they were they were kind of over overdoing things. Um, can you see that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so this this is the the the, the opposite of that. Uh, and, and this is the idea that that at the heart of all of these different elements um, of, of what you enjoy, what you're good at, uh, what there's a market for and what people are prepared to pay for is this central bit. And, and at the heart of that, uh, Ikai, um, which is where you have found your purpose. You know, so, so you're good at it. Uh, you enjoy doing it. You're well rewarded for doing it. It doesn't feel like you're, you're going to work. And I think that this is the thing that gives, gives us all kind of strength doesn't it uh, you know if if you're in this position you can make those decisions about i'm going to leave my job because it doesn't fit into this and if you if you feel that you're doing this you feel that you're doing something which really is your calling uh, whether that's putting the wheel on a car in a factory or doing what perhaps we do uh, it, it's one of those things where you're able to ride out the, the bad times as well as enjoying the good times isn't it and, so is, and, the, is the concept that you need all of these four buckets full in order to have found purpose and definition and, and true meaning? I, I, I don't think it says that you need them, but it says that that's where that that joyous bit resides. Right. Because, you know, th there are bits that like uh, uh, what you love and uh, what I'm good at might be 
and I, I don't mean this to be arrogant, might be playing the guitar, for example, but no matter how hard I try... Or just, just playing... off the top of your head. <laughs> 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 buying, buying guitars. Okay, but buying guitars. Um, but, but, you know, then there's... there's uh, but, but if people won't pay you for it, it it's, a, it's a pointless exercise, whatever that thing is. And I think that, that uh, refining that and making sure that, you know, it is part of your most authentic self. And we talk a lot about authenticity in our work, but, you know, it really does reflect the truest version of who you are and the best version of who you are. And it's something that people need and the world needs. And it's something that you're good at. And it's something that doesn't feel like it's hard work. But like you said, Eric, you know, uh, do what you love and you never need to work another day in your life. And you said, no, you work harder than you've ever worked. But actually you do, but it doesn't really feel like working quite the same way. No, it feels you know? more like having a stroke every day. <laughs> <laughs> aneurysm. More like an aneurysm, yeah. <laughs> more like an aneurysm, yeah, every day. But, but you know, you, you wake yeah. up on a Monday morning and you don't go, oh my God. I know, yeah, yeah totally. Uh, totally. You know, you, you wake up energised and you more, get more, early. More, 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 um, more of being able to do my mission and more b b being able to do my vocation and yeah, more of that, more of that. Yeah. So th the one thing that I don't see here is that, so this this is, I guess, applied very much to a vocation in life. So in order to get that mission, that that feeling of purpose out of a vocation. But there are things that, like what you said earlier on, you don't make any money from your guitar playing no. you know, at the moment. I don't make any money for um, scribbling, scribbling like an idiot on the canvases. But I get great intrinsic value from that. Absolutely. Massive intrinsic value that will fill up passion, and it feels like a vocation and it feels like a bit of a mission that I'm on, but it's just not my profession. But I get massive intrinsic value. I made, I, for the first time in two years, I made dough last night for our new pizza oven, which is a, a moon landing in this house. Um, and Sarah phoned at four o'clock and said, can you make some dough? And I went online and got a quick dough recipe from Jamie Oliver and got z double zero flour and stood and made pizza dough. Um, and uh, did, and did you I, do that throwing it up in the air thing? I did a little bit of that yeah. and ended up with ended up with a, a <laughs> pizza a pizza hat at one point. But I got amazing. I, I said to to Austin and Sarah last night as they were eating their delicious pizza that actually made with your sweat, made with my sweat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the the process of getting to this point where the pizzas are done was so much fun, so much intrinsic value out of making dough and setting everything up for them all coming in from school and work and all that was just fabulous. Just the, the, but but the act of doing it was cathartic and and just beautiful. Is, 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 well, there's, there's, there's this weird dichotomy as well between um, your doing something that you're um, that with purpose that you're passionate about. Um, I watched um, uh, King Richard a little while ago about uh, Richard Williams um, and the obviously the Williams sisters, and the whole way through that movie, um, which is was true, was that. He was so focused on the girls enjoying the tennis. It wasn't about the money and, and, and them. It was like, I want them to just be happy in the sport. And that's what made them super successful. Co he, wanted, coaches... he wanted all the millions of happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coaches, that was a side coaches, effect. Coaches, coaches talk when they're working with people or when the sportsmen, they talk about being in flow. Yeah, and in flow, flow state, is yeah. when you're in that moment where actually... Yeah. You know, everything that you've planned and trained for, you know, seems to happen it. almost effortlessly. And yeah. I think the icky guy is really more about that, about how can you find that flow state from all of these different um, things which are going to, that you do have an impact on you. And, I love and that. Maybe, I love maybe for some people or for most people, uh, that doesn't come just from one thing. No. So, this, so this is about balancing your painting and your pizza making with your work, with your family, with your travel, with all of those things that you do. Uh, and and I think that, that we often get uh, a sense of restlessness and, and dissatisfaction when that that is out of balance. And it might not be that you're working too many hours, but it might be that you're thinking too much about a job that isn't your passion. So it takes mm -hmm. over your life, even if you're at home watching TV with your family and you're still worrying about that meeting where you're going to have all of your ideas stolen and taken to somebody else's or whatever the situation is. <laughs> I had mine printed on sales collateral and it just showed up one day. I was like, oh, this was the most Hold on a minute. It didn't <laughs> you as the originator. So what, what happened? What happened? Um, I, someone had asked me like, hey, what are your thoughts on this product launch? 
uh, what do you like, what are, what are your ideas around this? And I literally like didn't, didn't even just kind of like spat off some stuff. I mean, the format of the email that I sent back on my thoughts, my like ideas, it was exactly the same. It was just like printed with a logo and like three bullet points that showed up like 10 days later. It was like the fastest turnaround on any like project. And then all of a sudden I'm like, what? This, this is not like sales collateral. This was an email I sent. Like, I just thought that was a brainstorm word for word. Oh so, man. Oh, yeah. wow. Nice. So here, here we are at the mid stage. We've, we've got through quite a lot of content already. Um, great that people have been adding comments. Please continue to do that. We love seeing those come in. And uh, as a kind of then segue into the next phase, let's go to, to Brentley because you've got a good news. You've got a happy kind of story to share with us today, haven't you? I've, I've got to feel good for today. It's some it's wisdom. wisdom Are you going to share that, Brentley? Or do you want me to yeah. I should be able to. Cool. I liked Eric's way of. Oh, hairstyling. Eric. Yeah, <laughs> hairstyle. Yeah, your center parting and, and, and fashion. Fashion. Yes. So good. Yeah. So good. this this look takes a lot of work. <laughs> Almost as much. I have a screenshot. I got to pull it up on um, LinkedIn real quick. Some great comments coming in from uh, from our lovely uh, viewers today. Fantastic. And I've actually just been sent a document by Andrew Slesser, which was something from uh, quite a while ago that he's pulled out about managers and leaders. And uh, I might share it with the group if that's okay, Andrew. Yeah, no, please just give us a nod. Or if it's confidential, I'll, uh, I won't play you, it. You, you'll share it with the group anyway. Yeah, I'll share it with the group anyway, but just won't say anything <laughs> about you. <laughs> Did it, was that um, enough of a filler for you? Are you ready, Brenty? Shall we keep yeah. going? I had closed. I had closed. Should we, do, should we do some card tricks or something? A Nick, horse walks Nick, into a bar. Nick, Nick, yeah. Nick, do, do some water tricks, Nick. <laughs> okay. Dance for us. Why? <laughs> so, did any of you guys call this by chance? No. Number We're not toll free in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't afford that number. <laughs> Okay. Oh my goodness, that is oh my goodness, it's so funny. <laughs> Does it actually happen? This this is an art. Can, can you ring it ring it now and, and put it on live? <laughs> I that would can't. be amazing. <laughs> I hope that we can hear it. I mean it's so good. I have there's two bits of information or uh pieces of advice that I just thought were great. Um one of them is if you're if um if you're if you're feeling up high and unbalanced think of groundhogs another one was yep. um if you're mad you can always go to your room and punch a pillow and scream and cry on it nice um and so it's just life advice right, from from me. little kindergartners yes tell me so if i guess it, is it recordings Bienvenidos a Pepstock, un proyecto creado por los estudiantes de West High School. Para un mensaje feliz, presiona 5. Please listen to the following options for encouraging messages. If you're feeling mad, frustrated, or nervous, press 1. <laughs> Words of Life advice. Life advice. If you need a pep talk from kindergartners, Which one? Three. One or two? Life, life, advice. life advice. Life advice. Life advice, definitely. That's what I did first. Be grateful for yourself. Be grateful for yourself. Live it up. Live it up. <laughs> I trust that you can make things right. Be happy. Try it again. Believe in yourself. If you're feeling up high, up high and unbalanced, think of groundhog. Think of groundhog. It's okay to be different. Always stay together. Don't give up power. Oh. We already like you. Never back down ever. <laughs> The world is a better oh, well, Am I the only one whose inner voice actually sounds like that? <laughs> <laughs> that's like, oh, that's man, like calling that's Nick great. every day. 
<laughs> Nicky, you the voiceover for that for the Haribo adverts in the UK. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, too, like it's, it's too Park. bad. We it's too bad when we get older. We can't Fantastic. keep some of that simplicity, that innocence. Um, you know, yeah. it's great. You know, I get it from you know my. I have a five year old, so I'm always getting these you know words of wisdom from her. You know, things like sometimes I like to play by myself. Sometimes I play with friends. <laughs> Kids are incredibly smart, and I think we have a tendency to make them more stupid. <laughs> we need to listen to them more. Well, there's that lovely. Could they spend time around us as well? Yeah. There's that lovely yeah. John Lennon quote, isn't there? When the teacher at school says to him, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" and he says, "Happy," and the teacher says, "I don't think you've understood the question," and he says, "I don't think you've understood life." And it's such a powerful. I mean, it's it's probably yeah. not true, but it's still think you know whether it's true. Life. But but it's <laughs> yeah, but it's such a powerful concept, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I listen to a lot of Abraham Hicks, and um, that's like a thing that it was actually on an episode today. Like she says, we come into this world with just like the right vision and the right view, and whether it's either just like being. Um, simplistic or just finding the joy and the and the little things and like playing and then we lose that over time. Um, so, I mean, not everybody can just like borrow a niece or a nephew or go hang out with their kids for a little bit. So things like this and social awesome. media giving us Fabulous. access. I mean, yeah. But look at look at look at what we do as humans. I mean, t Tim Hughes. Um, how many pieces of vinyl in the collection today? Oh, about three. Yeah, three <laughs> thousand more like. But he's, you've been doing that since you were a kid, right? And you probably yeah. still get the same sense of wonderment when you take that vinyl yeah, out do, and the yeah. smell and all of that. I uh, I was into comic books when I was younger. I used to I used to love actually the old British Indeed. comics, Wh Wizard and Chips and Cheeky and all of these things. And, and Damn what's that? And Viz. <laughs> yeah, well, Viz later <laughs> on, yeah. Um, Bino and Dandy and all that, but I loved, uh, I loved Cheeky and uh, Wizard and Chips, and then that that got into the more sort of 2000 AD and uh, and Judge Dread and all that. I uh, I absolutely adored those things, and they used to give me an amazing sense of wonderment and escape. I found a box when we were moving house to come here, full of old comic books, and I sat down and I was 11 years old again for half an hour, 11 years old again, just absorbed, just going through the pages, and then Sarah said, "Oi." Stuff to do, adult stuff, complications, <laughs> and that's just life, isn't it? You go back to being doing the playing the guitar or making the dough or smelling the vinyl or whatever it is, and then someone reminds you you've got serious stuff to do. Yeah, Boo. but it's like it's like you know, you when you're a kid, you have all these ideas and and dreams and things you'd like to try, and then you know somewhere along the way you kind of lose that. I actually. Um, just connected with a woman. I can't remember her last name. Lou. I want to say Lou Ann Chan. I think her name is. Um, anyway, she wrote a book about how she got unstuck by promising herself that she would do something new or different every day, and she started doing that in in a year. I, I Eric, didn't you do something like that? Anyway. Um, just, just, you know, try something new, you know, every day, try something new. Don't say yes. Don't say no. And yeah. I certainly went through a period of time where I was saying no to everything. And pretty soon all I had was my work yeah, and lots of it, you know, and you'll miss out on life if you're always saying tomorrow i'll do it tomorrow i'll do it you know there's there's a thing that um that pixar does and I'm, I think, I'm sure i've mentioned it before where they uh, once a month they take everyone across all the different departments and they get them to do like a sculpture or ballet class or right. some kind of creative so everyone everyone across departmentally uh, sort of regresses into that that state of being a kid again and it becomes playful and, and people start talking because you're in that kind of classroom environment it's a great way of, and we, we mentioned this before about how um, Apple's new campus is the way it's structured and organized so that people can actually walk past you know, um, office spaces and actually engage in conversation with people. It's, it just opens up that culture a bit more. And it's, um, so it's a large component of what I like about the 
uh, kind of that kind of student teacher dy dynamic you just kind of I think people just kind of regress to being kids and, and if you can make that environment kind of playful you strip away a lot of that you know veneer of, of uh, the uh, the the crap that we pile on as grown-ups <laughs> and I think it starts really young at in the U.S. as early as kindergarten we start asking for them to have these answers what do you want to be when you grow up we start like yeah very early on and without even realizing it you're kind of watering down that imagination. Them. yeah that imagination yeah. and creativity by asking them to have an answer of these things that already exist and especially kids like today we can't even imagine what their world is going to be like when they're a working age so the fact yeah. that we want them to say oh i want to be a lawyer i want to be an astronaut no offense I'm like, tell me now 15 years old tell me my, my, daughter, my, daughter's, my daughter's 10 years old and she wants to be an adventurer. I'm like, great. I love that. Awesome. We were doing <laughs> that <laughs> as children ourselves. I, I remember a uh, Dr. Seuss book where I actually got to write in the book and it said, when I grow up, I want to be blank and I had to fill it in. What did you write? And I wrote, I, yeah. you know, with one of those a jumbo pencils and I etched <laughs> it in Neil's an stone. Abelman expert. Sales and Abelman specialist. <laughs> I wrote cowboy and then I yeah. erased it. <laughs> and then I wrote astronaut and then I erased it. And then I wrote everything man. My dad the other day turned to me and said, Rob, you finally become an everything man, haven't you? That's I said, amazing. Dad, yes, the key is you just can't do it all at the same time. <laughs> I, if you I've look back at my career and all the things that I've done, I am an everything man. <laughs> that's that's the name of your book, right? Changes LinkedIn man. profile immediately. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. Just, just Adam, really, Adam, just Adam Grant in his in his book, uh, thinking again, uh, says it's the worst thing you can ask of anybody growing yes, up. Is yes. What do you want to be when you get older? Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. just scrub it out because it what, starts to. What are you going to be when you grow up, Will? I don't know because I I don't think I've grown up yet. So yeah, me can too. We, can, we, can we take ten seconds, just one word? Because I know Will's pushed for time. Can we take one word and just go go? Nick, what was it you wanted to be? What well, did you want to be? Up, um, I wanted to be a, a film director. Whatever. Film director, Linwood. Yeah. Uh, I don't recall what I wanted to do when I was little. Will soldier, soldier, amazing, uh, cowboy, astronaut, everything, man. Brittany, Brittany, Brittany. 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 An orthodontist. Brittany. What did you want to be? An orthodontist. An orthodontist. Yeah. Alex? Yeah, well, it's a bit embarrassing because I didn't really know what I wanted to be. And then and then I chose a uh, property surveyor because I thought they earned a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> How many kids are sitting at school? Do. One day I'll be a property surveyor. <laughs> One I day. will survey the property. Victorian manager. <laughs> uh, Adam? Uh, when I got older and I had more of a sense of self, so like a, a teenager, musician, of course. Yeah. And uh, Tim? Footballer. Footballer. Well, I never. And Eric? Well, uh, uh, it was a musician. Okay. Always a musician. That's right. So, great. Yep, so you're sorry. right. We, we've got still got a couple of um, uh, people's bits and pieces to go through no, so let's go, let's, get, get, let's go adult again and let's go to Lenwood for you to share your piece of content please okay I'm going to share um, this piece of content from uh, Rajesh Se Seti he is uh, just an awesome guy he's done can you see it nope uh oh, nope. Uh -oh. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. oh, oh there it is oh Okay, I guess I'll stop sharing. Okay. Uh, oh. oh. I messed up. Sorry. I thought Tim was doing it. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see that. Okay, so Rajesh um, creates these, um, he calls them napkin sites. And um, I think he's worthwhile to have him on actually the program. He's such an interesting person. He wrote his first book, I believe, at age nine or 10. And uh, underachiever, then. Huh? An underachiever. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. And he, and what's so interesting is that he wrote this book, um, you know, living in a small village in India where they had um, only one phone 
in the town. Uh, it was at the, at the grocery store and uh, he would walk to the grocery store to use the phone to try to sell this book <laughs> that he had written. Anyway, he, he could tell the story better. He does, he does these um, things called uh, napkin sites. Um, they started some years ago. Now he has over 3,000 of them. They're um, words of wisdom, um, you know, that he has come up with, I guess, over the years. Uh, you can go to napkinsites.com and you can share them uh, on your social media if you want. But um, they're all things like this one. You know, gaining mastery requires your willpower to win against whatever friction that arises along the way. And um, I just wanted to, to kind of point it out. Uh, this one's a particularly good one, but they're all really interesting and and good and um so i just wanted to share that and encourage people to uh check out napkin sites and maybe connect with rajesh he's a he's a really interesting person superb thank you very much mm, for that's that. great yeah love it brilliant <laughs> i think the stuff around mastery is always uh, is always interesting daniel pink always um he, he talks about it in, in one of his books and the different stages you get to to going to mastery but that, that, that's a new one, which I hadn't seen before. So thanks for, for sharing. So yeah. let's, let's, let's go on to, uh, let's go on to Rob now, because I know Rob's got to leave us in a second or two. So. Okay. Let me um, bring it up. And we're back going on with recruiting the... with you, aren't we? I'll just play some pause yes. music while he's pulling it up. Going with the, the meme theme this week. Uh, Hold on, me... Paul, huh? <laughs> 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 to me, this post is evidence that we can no longer refer to this period as the Great Reshuffling. Tim, I, I believe you mentioned that according to data from LinkedIn, in the U.S., there are three job posts for every salesperson. And in the U.K., that grows to five job posts for every one salesperson. That's not simply a reshuffling. Uh, a reshuffling is like a game of musical chairs where there are no chairs removed between rounds. Yes, there's a lot of commotion. Everyone gets up and shuffles around a bit. But when the music stops, everyone has a seat. Nobody's left standing and there are no empty chairs. This graphic and the stats Tim shared indicate something else is going on. The music has started. People are shuffling around. But as the music stops, we're left with a lot of empty chairs apparently up to five empty chairs for everyone who's looking to sit down. So my question is, where is everyone going? And what does this mean for organizations like DICE who cannot get people to even apply to their openings? Mr. DJ, I'm feeling a bit nostalgic today. Can you please cue up the 70s AM gold classic from Randy Van Warner? Just when I needed you most. <laughs> Have I you got it? <laughs> you like easy very, very good, very good. I love, I love you, Mr. You come on every week, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you are love it. On the radio show at four o'clock with, uh, with 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 Adam and Eric as well. Yeah, <laughs> you're listening to Flywheel Radio. <laughs> <laughs> this is... what, what's interesting what's interesting about that post rob is i just went on the dice website you know to see what kind of organization it is you know yes we all know about kind of putting out posts etc you know a bit of tumbleweed i think they've got seventy five thousand followers yeah but, but and... what's being done to engage them That's and do I... you know what they do every recruiting like agency no. What? <laughs> <laughs> they recruit technical hires. Wow. Yeah, I see a bunch of heads down. No, they don't. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, yeah, fair. They're not. Yeah, if you're gonna put me, if you're gonna be putting a job posting on LinkedIn, then you need to probably have a presence there, and you need to be engaging with the people that you want to come in. You know, I. One would hope. I yeah. 
Thank, no, thanks for sharing that, Rob. So let's let's just uh, round everything off. Tim Tim's going to finish up, and we talked earlier on about people getting out more and going to conferences, and I think you've got something on that theme, haven't you, Tim? Uh -huh. yeah, I saw. Oh, oh, go ahead. I heard the girl from Epanema. Adam, can you ever look at Slack a moment? I can't seem to share my screen. Could you share it? <laughs> 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 Hold on tight, folks. Scarf behind you. It's like when there's a delay at Disney. Hold on tight, folks. There's a slight delay. We'll be right back. We're about oh, to have some fun. Right. Are you are you ready? Yeah. Have you? Uh... Yeah. Hold on. Bye, Rob. Bye, Robert. Bye, Rob. Yeah. That one. Oh, wrong one. Hang on. Oh. Oh, came back. <laughs> yeah. Here we Push go. the red button, Tim. Here we go. Oh, Push around. the red one. <laughs> Can you see that? Okay. Is that your post, Tim? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, yeah. This, this is from uh, Wendy Muirhead, who's the managing director at um, Cerulean. And um, it, it just really struck me that, you know, we've been locked up because of COVID for the last two years. And here's people out actually enjoying themselves, talking to people being social, meeting people. And it's and it's really nice to see this sort of stuff. I know that some people may turn around and say this isn't Facebook, it's LinkedIn, but this is lifestyle. This is people being professional. It's business. It's just really nice to see. I, and, I, and I just thought I'd uh, point it out. It's nice. Yeah, I love it, Tim. Um, I saw um, posts for HR Transform which was in person. Um, and I saw how much fun people were having and I wished that I was there. Something though that is really interesting that I noticed it, as people were talking about the event, which is so cool, a lot of the relationships started online and people were seeing people in person for the first time at the event. Folks, I'm telling you, that's the future. <laughs> that is the future, meeting people first online and then with intentionality going to an event to meet them in person. It's I think coming. that's I think that's the now. I think the future yeah. is we meet them online and then we send our avatar to the show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the future. The avatar goes. But yeah. but you know, I um I happened to be on a panel with a um thought leading expert who was saying he hadn't heard of people really starting relationships online and then meeting offline he said he thought most relationships were still um starting offline and and then they wow. move online but you know i didn't have a chance to tell him i i think it's actually the re reverse and as the demographics change right with a younger people who are they're starting all their relationships online right it's gonna be the it's it's the reverse starting your relationship online and then meeting up with people in person T tinder have been doing that for a while haven't they <laughs> Yeah. Have you guys seen Tinder Swindler? Tinder, yeah, what, no. what is Netflix. that? Oh so, my so. gosh! I saw the ad for it, but professional I didn't. Professional con artist, and it is fascinating. <coughs> really? The yeah. Tinder Swindler is that? It's two hours. Is it one on Swindler, Netflix? or like uh, they're talking about like a trend of it happening? It's one. It's oh, a story one. of one. The story and, of one. And he Swindler. is um, he's a worldwide. Swindler, very wow. interesting. Yeah, but basically gets uh, women, so, sorry, women to part with money, and then he uses zero money, and they don't have it. Yeah, is, That's is that part. is there a reason why Rob just ducked out of this conversation? Is he the? <laughs> 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 All of a sudden, Rob is gone. I was like, wait, you, you never see them in the same room together. <laughs> <laughs> why, is it, why, why are all my friends telling me to watch um, Brand New Cherry Flavor, episode four, at um, around about four minutes in? Everyone's that's taking the internet by storm that seemingly that's a really important thing to watch. Does anyone know? I've, I've watched the first episode and uh, I couldn't I couldn't get the wife into it. And it has to be a, we have to, both of us have to be a, on the same same wavelength, the same page, how to watch it. And um, yeah, she wasn't feeling it. So haven't got as far as episode four, but I may dip back in. Just, just, um, just in case anyone's wondering, can, can you only see that as LinkedIn user? That's um, the, lo that's the lovely John can. Bloomfield. Yeah, oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah, I saw his post today. Yeah, he's been down at Oceanology at the XL. 
Well, everybody, that is the, the top of the hour. That's 60 yeah. minutes, which has just flown yeah, by. Let me go quickly. It certainly mm. did. Well, well done, so Will. Indeed for well all done, of Will. Sharing. Cracking job, Will. Yeah. Most welcome. Look, have a great rest of the day, wherever you are, and a great weekend. And um, some of us, at least, will look forward to seeing you uh, again next week, hopefully. And next week, Eric's doing it. <gasps> ah, brilliant. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have said, because now you'll have less viewers. <laughs> 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 Hello. Let's step up the promo.